Come on, New Hope, and welcome all of our campuses. If you're a guest here, you might be, what does he mean by that? We are one church in many locations, so we want to welcome Kenya Campus. I'll talk about them in just a moment. Columbia, South Carolina, Sanford, Garner, Wake Forest, Hillsboro, Durham Campus, all of you online. Come on, everybody at all the campuses, celebrate the movement today. Hey, uh, you guys want some good news? Y'all like good news? Um, Here's some really, really good news, and uh, I'll frame it in this way. Who knows what our vision is? Reach, teach, and release. You got it. The day we stop reaching people for Jesus, teaching people this word, and releasing world changers is the day we should close shop and go home. Let me tell you what God did during our Christmas services we saw 10,100-plus people come through the doors of New Hope Church. Ho, ho, that, that's good. That's definitely worth celebrating. Okay, but check this out. 354 people gave their lives to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. That's worth celebrating. And as I've said over and over and over, listen, every number has a name. Every name has a face. Every face represents a soul for which Jesus Christ came, lived, bled, died, and rose again. Let us never forget that every number matters because every person matters to God. Can I get a strong amen from the people of God? Come on, that's good, good Christmas. Uh, hey, I got some more good news for you. You want some more? Um, my wife, uh, Amy Lynn, and my oldest son, Benjamin, um, firstborn boy. Now, his brother is here who is his twin, and if he had the microphone right now, he would let you know that he's only the firstborn by like 90 seconds. <laughs> but anyway, he was the firstborn. He and 16 others have arrived in Kenya um, safely on Saturday. They served at Street Hope, where we're diligently trying to rescue uh, girls from sex trafficking. We're trying to alleviate poverty in that particular area. There's some pictures of the children. They arrived safely, and they're doing an incredible work, and they started hiking uh, to, uh, yesterday, and my wife just sent me a text right before I walked on the stage today. Uh, their first day of hiking was a success. They will hike Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, they will hit the summit on New Year's Eve of the second highest mountain in Kenya. They will watch the sunrise into the new decade of 2020 with 18 new hopers who are raising funds to build a hope center in Kenya. And so let me just, let me just encourage you to pray for them. And um, if you're interested, you can go to hikeforhope2019.com. We're already building the Hope Center there. And most of you know that it's our desire, but we're really just seeking the will of God. It depends on if it's his will, but we're hoping and praying that God will enable us to build or renovate or find in downtown Durham a Hope Center so we can bring a Hope Center stateside and it can serve regionally throughout North Carolina. So we're really, really excited about that. Hey, I, I'm just going to follow the Holy Spirit here because we can do what we want to do on a day like today, right? Don't you? We should follow the Holy Spirit every Sunday, though. Don't you agree? But I just, my, my, my best friend is here, and he's a faithful new hoper. And you might not know this, but a faithful new hoper leads the largest um, fight against sex trafficking and modern-day slavery. I'm talking about Joe Schmidt sitting right here on the front row. Would you, would you show him some love? The reason I want to mention that is because what's our vision? Reach teach, release. That's a perfect example of releasing a world changer 
who's out on the front lines. He worships here every Sunday, but Monday through Saturday, he's out on the front lines globally all over the world fighting these evils and atrocities in our day and age. So, brother, I love you, and I'm so stinking proud of you. Um, so, a um, couple things uh, real quickly. Um, I, I have felt led today to, um, to, I believe, give you a treat. And, uh, and what I mean by that treat is um, we have a, a woman on staff who I am a big fan of. Uh, I believe deeply in who she is. Her name is Margot Jurgensen. And Margot, um, Margot used to tour with the Daraja Choir. Most of you know about the Daraja Choir. They've been here many, many times. A choir from Africa. And uh, she started doing that in 2015. In 2007, they came through here. In 2017, we hired her, brought her into really what, what is our ministry residency program. You guys will remember in the past, I, I laid out a vision for our 10th anniversary that we want to be a church that pours into the next generation. Can I get an amen? Those of you who are not of the, the, the next generation, like you and me, if we don't do that, the church is only one generation away from extinction. Let that settle in for a moment. And so I have a real heart for young people. And uh, when we met Margot, we're like, man, come on. So she came on to our ministry residency program. And then uh, we're like, oh, man, dude. We want to hire that woman of God. And so we hired her, and for the last couple of years, she's been uh, doing student ministries here, and she um, launched, if you will, and really brought life to our young adult ministry. And uh, she, her, her leadership capacity and the anointing upon her life. When we met her, she already loved the Lord God with all of her heart, mind, soul, and strength. She just loves God. She's bold in her faith. I love that about her. But I quickly discerned uh, that there is a calling and a gifting upon this woman's life. And I'm so thankful she's on this team. And I want to develop her. And so I've invited her to uh, preach from this stage. It's her first time. It's her first time. And... Um, I was talking to her yesterday, and I said, Margo, listen, you just be you. I said, you, you don't have to find your voice. You, you already have your voice. You be you. I reminded her, and this is my prayer every Sunday, by the way, before I come out here. I have a long prayer that, that I pray. Um, it's laminated on a sheet, and it sits in my office. And one of the phrases on that sheet is, Lord God, remind me that this is not an audience to be feared, but a family to love. And so I, call, I called her yesterday, and we were talking on the phone. I said, listen, this is not an audience to be feared. This is a family to be loved. I said, they will love you. They love the word. And uh, as, I was, as I hung up with her, I started thinking about my first message that I preached. It, it, it's in my house. It's on a cassette tape. Young person, that's a square little plastic thing. It's on a cassette tape. And every now and then, I will pull it out just to humble myself because it's awful. It's terrible. Terrible sermon. Um, and, and, <laughs> and one of the things I can promise you is this will not be terrible. Uh, she is gifted. And she's just going gonna to teach a, a, a short message. And then after that, we're going to show you a video um, of Amanda's story. And Amanda's an awesome young adult here who we baptized not long ago who also has a great story. And it's just a cool, unique day. So sit back, take a deep breath, grab your pen, grab your teaching notes, and do what you do right? You love guest speakers. I love this about this church. You love when other people step on the stage to bring the word. So welcome her with only uh, the new hope welcome that we are used to, and welcome her for the first time teaching on this stage, Margo Jerkinson! <laughs> what is up? <laughs> wow. Well, hello. Y'all are doing great. Wow, you're making me feel great. I just wanna honor and celebrate our pastors, Benji and Amy Lynn. Um, they have loved and encouraged and supported me since the day I got here. And um, I'm super honored to get to teach you what I've been teaching Jesus. So can we just celebrate them and what God is doing through them all across the world? Yes, amen, amen. Um, like he told you, I'm actually originally from Louisiana. So admittedly, I believe in full transparency. I used to call that the real South up until yesterday. And then North Carolina proved me wrong. And there was almost 70 degree weather. 
sunny in December, and I was like, amen, I am still in the South, y'all. So I'm happy about it. I am Southern through and through. Um, but I got to a chance to go back to Louisiana over Thanksgiving break, and I don't know what it is about me, but I push all the actual adulting responsibilities to vacation time, because I just don't wanna do it like on my day-to-day -day life. So when I decided to go back home, I went to the eye doctor, and I feel like I should tell you because people have apparently become concerned about my eyes. I was just going for a checkup, okay? You should know that right now. Um, my eyes are fine. But I just went for a checkup, and um, I am a stereotypical millennial. I have no shame in my game, okay? I wish I could snap my fingers and get the prescription in my hand. Um, because let me tell you, I went to this eye doctor appointment and spent not one, not two, not three. Y'all, I spent four hours at the eye doctor, right? Now you wanna snap your fingers and be the stereotypical millennial with me, right? I know, I know. And so um, I'm finding myself these days in a lot of scenarios and seasons and situations that I either didn't expect to be in or um, I'm in there longer than I thought I'd be. Come on, can somebody relate? And, um, and so I've just decided when I find myself in these places, I'm just gonna ask Jesus while I'm here, what are you trying to teach me? And so I began to ask him that with my eyes dilated, sitting there three hours at the eye doctor appointment, listening to the same commercial above my head over and over. I'm like, Jesus, while I'm here, <laughs> what would you like to teach me for real? And, um, and he began to teach me. It's funny, in my life, maybe it's true in your life too, I admittedly have spent way more time expecting and waiting and hoping on God to show up and teach me than I have actually wholeheartedly seeking and asking him. And what I'm learning is that as his sons and daughters, for those of us who have accepted Christ, when we actually ask our father to do things, he does them. Like he moves on behalf of his children. And so I have started asking, maybe you'll join me in 2020, asking the father when you find yourself in these places, Jesus, while I'm here, what would you like to teach me? So he began to teach me. And um, I go into this, uh, finally, got to go in the uh, office, and the woman sits me down and puts this massive thing in front of my face, right? And it's called a fryopter, I believe someone told me recently. Hey, yes. And, um, and so I put it in front of my face, and she, she's like, okay, tell me what you see. And I, so I really thought she was joking, because I was like, uh, yeah, is there something up there? That's hilarious. And then I looked to the side, she's not amused at all, and so I'm like, uh, nothing. Yeah, I see nothing. And my coping mechanism is laughing. So I'm hysterical. She is not. And so she gets up and she changes the lens and she's like, okay, let's try the skin. What do you see? Mm -hmm. What do we do to see better, right? We squint, right? Because that makes a lot of sense. So I'm squinting really hard. And I'm like, maybe there's a V in there somewhere. She's like, no. And so I start getting really anxious at this point. Anxiety is rising up. One, because have you been in this situation where things are like not so great and then someone affirms that they're not so great and they go from being bad to worse, right? So I'm looking at the screen and I'm thinking, Margo, you're 27 years old. Like you should be able to read both round one and round two of all the letters and you can't read one letter. And she's looking at you like either you're crazy blind or just crazy. So I am super uncomfortable at this point in time. But two... I suddenly felt the weight of knowing that something is there and not being able to clearly see it. And the truth is, so many of us in this place, at all of our campuses, watching online, there came a moment in time where you saw the love of God in the cross, that cross that descended down on the Christmas Eve services, and Pastor Benji explained how it made a way for a pardon for our past, and a purpose for our future. And you saw, wow, God really loves me because there's no way I could ever work my way up to the perfection and the glory of Jesus. And I have a God that loves me so much, he didn't even ask me to work my way up to his standard, he came down. And not only did he lay his life down and pay for what I owe, the sin that separates me from our Father, but then he freely gave me a perfect relationship with a perfect Father, which he deserves. You saw the love of God. My question is, right here, right now, do you see his love for you clearly? I wonder if you've settled for knowing that the Father loves you, but not being able to see his love for you. Have you actually rationalized that it's okay that you don't see his love because we have the cross, and the cross is a picture of his love for me. But see, the thing is, we have a father who loves his children too much to just let them settle for knowing it. He wants you to see it every single day, every single moment, that he radically 
recklessly, sacrificially loves you. It wasn't meant to just stay on the cross. And the truth is, that's kind of foreign for most of us. And so I'm really excited because I believe that God today is going to give us a new lens, a lens of love to see clearly. And I wanna turn to a piece in scripture where um, Jesus himself is speaking to people about the importance of us seeing clearly. And so in Matthew chapter seven, this is what Jesus says. He says, why do you look at the speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention to the plank in your own eye? How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plank in your own eye? You hypocrite. First take the plank out of your own eye and then you will see clearly to remove the speck from your brother's eye. No matter what generation you're a part of, no matter where you're from, what your backstory may be like, the reality is you and I both live in a world that says that our behavior determines our identity. And so even as children of God, we can look at the scripture and immediately think, you know what, Jesus is telling me to go to work. He's telling me to get it together finally. You know, the areas that I'm still slipping up, the, the sins that I'm still struggling with, the things that I can't stop visualizing and desiring and watching, he's telling me enough is enough, I need to get my act together. You know what, let's just claim it, church. Let's claim 2020 is gonna be the year that we're finally fixed by the Father. And the problem is, so many of you would wanna claim that because you actually believe that the goal of following Jesus is to get fixed by the Father. And the problem is, that's not love if there's an agenda involved. And I really believe what scripture says is true, that it's the truth that sets us free. And I came to set the record straight about some things and help us to see truth that I believe will set us free going into 2020. See, because the truth is, Jesus did lay his life down on the cross, and it was for God so loved the world that he sent his only son to do that, absolutely. But see, it's important that we realize why he did die and why he didn't die, because then we see what love really looks like. See, he did not die so that you would get your act together. He did not lay his life down for you to one day meet your full potential. He did not die so that he could just fix all your broken bad parts and make them good. He laid his life down for you so that you would never have to go a moment without knowing that you are loved. You know, the moment that you receive Jesus as your savior, um, we have a three in one God, right? Father, Son, Holy Spirit. So to get to the Father, you must surrender to the Son. And the moment that you surrender to the Son, scripture says that you're marked and you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. Now, Holy Spirit does two things. Holy Spirit teaches us what is true and Holy Spirit reminds us of what God said. Now what's true is that you are loved, but not for what you do, for who you are. And what did God say? God said at the beginning, get this, before you even spoke your first word, before you breathed your first breath, before you surrendered your life to him and any transformation ever happened, he spoke over you very good, very good. See, unlike the message of the world, the message of the word is that you are not what you do. You are not what's been done to you. You are not what you feel. Church, you are who God says you are. Your behavior does not determine your identity. Your maker does. And your maker wants you to see that he loves you clearly every single day and every way, and I think to do that, you must know that this is true. You are not on a journey of being fixed. You're on a journey of being loved. Jesus came so that you would experience the same love on the cross every single day in your ordinary life. Every single time you slip up, is not an opportunity for the Father to fix you. Every time that you and I still, yes, as Christians, as followers of Jesus, mess up, struggle, sin, limp, hurt, every single time we are like that and we fall into it, it is an opportunity for the Father to love us, not to fix us. And I wonder how many areas in your life, like in my life, I've been hiding out of shame that I'm still there. 
I've been hiding because it's not yet fixed, because I don't yet have it together. And all the while, the Father is just saying, all you're here for is just on a journey to receive my love. Will you let me love you? Because let me remind you that the same love that covered a multitude of sins on the cross is the exact same love that wants to cover a multitude of your sins now. See, just because you responded to the Father differently now than you did maybe before you received him does not mean that he responds differently to you. His response then was love, his response now is love because God is love. Love is not an event, love is a person. His name is Jesus and if you've received him, he wants you to know that doing life with him looks like walking and talking and living a journey of being loved and so I wonder today if you will receive his invitation to bring every single part, every single emotion, every single struggle to the Father and allow him to cover you with love because the beauty of the gospel is this, Jesus is light. And where light is, darkness cannot stand. I wonder what in your life today, you really are desperate for the Father to lift off, but you've been hiding in shame that I can't lift it off on my own and the good news is that Jesus is inviting you today as his sons and daughters to let him do the heavy lifting and to lift off the darkness in Jesus' name by simply bringing all of you to all of him. You know, I became really good friends with this girl named Amanda and in this season of her life, she's walked through a lot of pain and suffering and she's taught me in the most powerful way what it looks like to come with everything, unashamed. Every thought, every emotion, wherever you may find yourself today, she's taught me what it looks like to live like you're on a journey of being loved. And I wanted you to hear her story from her directly. And so will you join me? Let's check out Amanda's story. I would have never guessed that I would have struggled as much just in trusting God as I have in the past six years. As the neuromuscular disorders progressed, it's, it's taken a lot of wrestling and a lot of time on my knees and a lot of just, in a lot of ways, anger. And I've had a lot of mental blocks about um, being in a wheelchair, uh, not being able to walk, not being able to do things. And it took realizing that I had put a lot of strength in myself to, to finally realize that I wasn't really trusting God. He never once stopped pursuing me. He didn't think any less of me for my doubt. He didn't think any less of me for my feelings of anger and frustration, um, but if anything, he intensified his pursuits. And he's like, you know what? I need you to trust me. Even if you can't see why, I need you to fully know that I can take care of this and that no problem is bigger than I am. I've just really felt on my heart that I needed to go ahead and get baptized. For me, it's, it's my declaration that I am giving up total control, that you know, it doesn't matter if I'm in a wheelchair, it doesn't matter if I can walk, it doesn't matter if I need help sometimes. Um, that he's the one that's got total control. And so that was that was the importance of today, is just giving up all control. Even if it's not easy, even if it's painful sometimes, he's still right there with me. Now that's just a little snapshot, literally, of thousands of life change stories that God has been doing in and through you. And I know, I know sometimes we can kind of be consumeristic and we go to church thinking, what can I give out of, get out of it? But I just want to remind you that if you're a part of this church and you sow into this church, you give your financial resources to this movement, I just want to remind you that God used you mightily in 2019. And I wanna encourage you with me to claim by faith that God is going to continue to use this movement in 2020 and beyond. Can I get an amen? God doesn't have to, but for some reason, he just continues to anoint the ministries of this church, to anoint your generosity, my generosity, and he's helping us lift high the light of Christ and push back the darkness all over this world. And that's what this next moment is about. Our ushers are gonna come forward in just a moment and we're gonna receive today's tithes and offerings. Never think for a moment that this is not a part of worship. I dare say that one of the most worshipful things we do or we don't do every Sunday is this moment right here. 
And we've been talking the last few weeks about this Christmas love offering. And the truth is, um, there are many reasons I could talk to you about that. One, I, like I could tell you, hey, be sure to give by December 31st for your tax purposes. And that makes sense. I get it. But the main reason, I just want to encourage you to finish out the year strong. But more than that, I want to encourage you to be faithful in 2020. Is that God is using us to change the world. Or at least our corner of it, right? And this, this Christmas love offering is going specifically to the things that we love about life change, right? And a few of those would be this Hope Center in Kenya would be the possibility if God leads. I'm not declaring it yet. We sense it's God's will, but if God leads for us to take down a piece of property or an old building or a church in downtown Durham and, and, and build a Hope Center stateside, a regional Hope Center right here in Durham that would serve Central North Carolina, but we get to this point and we get to declare to God, hey, I not only say I believe, but I believe and trust you enough to honor you with my resources. And so if you want to do that, you can do that today. You can do that online. I know they already showed you the multiple ways to give. You can also go online. And, and if you want to give to the Christmas love offering, specifically to, to the, what we've been talking about the last few weeks, just designate that. You can designate it online or today, just designate it Christmas love offering. If you give online, there's a card in front of you, a little online giving card. If you're on the front row, balcony, or down here, there's one underneath your seat. And uh, we're gonna give to the Lord his tithes and our offerings, and then we're gonna continue to worship and sing. I'm just wondering, do we have any, come on, cheerful givers in the house today? Absolutely. Um, when that basket passes, you stand to your feet and let's worship God. Let's worship him now with our giving. Let's worship him after that with our singing and our praise, for he is worthy. Amen. Here we go. <laughs> 